All right, today on this episode of Bro Research Radio, we have Ryan LeCure. Ryan LeCure is a strength and conditioning professional. Uh, he currently lives in Austin, Texas, uh, worked for a long time up in the Northeast, and he's at Flow for the next kind of month and a half, helping us with events and just, just getting his training on down here. And today we wanted to kind of, we're going to jam on excess protein intake and the, the pitfalls that we see um, our fellow trainees and even, you know, even the general population uh, with dieting. And, and so happy to have you on, happy to have you at Flow. Yeah. Thank you for uh, inviting me into your basement. And uh, <laughs> I'm not excited to talk about this stuff because, you know, we've talked a lot about this uh, together just in random conversations when no one else wants to listen to us at the dinner table. And now it's nice to have an audience that may be as interested <laughs> as we are. Maybe. So uh, maybe we'll see. But you know, the this has always been a question uh, with myself and uh, reading more of the research recently, there's been a lot coming out about uh, protein consumption and you know how much do we need? And there's this idea that you can almost eat an indefinite amount of protein. I think it's, it's starting- With no negative consequences. With no negative consequences. Mm -hmm. And that would be fantastic if that were the case. So those are some things I kind of want to touch on. So first off, let's, let's just talk about like what happens if you do eat excess protein. Just in the, is there, is there any benefit? Let's start with that. Cause we're, this is pro research radio, right? We're talking about guys getting big or gals. And uh, you know, is there any benefit to eating excessive amounts of protein, anything over, you know, let's say one gram per pound? Well, I would even argue that one gram per pound might be excessive. If you look at the research, it looks like about 1.8 grams per kilogram is kind of the cutoff. And it's, it's not that one gram per pound is going to be bad for you. I don't, it, it, that doesn't matter. It seems like at about one grams per kilogram of body weight looks to be where you get that ex extreme diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you're, most of us, it's pretty easy to get there. Um, and so if, if you're 80 kilos, that's, you know, that's like 160 grams of protein. That's not hard. That's really, if you're eating meat, that's really easy to get in two meals. Um, and so what I, what I think ha what I think people don't realize is once you hit your, what you need for muscle growth or even just maintaining muscle mass, the, that excess protein is going to be utilized. Like the body is one thing that we know about the body is that it is insanely efficient. And so there's 13 amino acids that can be just churned right through the Krebs cycle, right into glucose via gluconeogenesis. You got, you got some amino acids that can go right to acetyl-CoA and be synthesized to fat. But one, so if your, your body is going to use protein probably for energy. So if you think about your body is as efficient as possible, it's always going to do the, the least costly thing. So it's, it's probably going to oxidize protein as a fuel source and then save fat. So if you're in, a, if you're in an excess of energy, it looks like that if you're consuming a lot of protein, your body will use that protein for energy and then store the fat that you're intaking, provided that you're eating enough fat. Um, if you're not eating enough fat, if you're eating a super very odd, this would be pretty hard diet to even do feasibly, would be a ton of protein, very low fat, and then a ton of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. which, which seems to be gaining popularity. Mm -hmm. yep. Uh, yep. And so then I think that your body would, um, that, that would be the least inefficient. So like that would be the least efficient way to do anything as far as storage of fat, mm -hmm. because then you're going to have this, you're going to have a ton of protein maybe running around that you can't use, oxidize well as a fuel. Uh, then you're going to have a minimal uh, fat to store, and then you're going to have a ton of carbohydrates that you're going to have to, that they're about 80, 85 to 90 percent efficiently stored as fat. So you're going to have to run that through um, the lipogenesis in the liver. And so the body can turn almost anything into anything. And so we only have two essential, really, you know, we have all the, the essential amino acids, and then we only have two essential fats, which is omega 3s and omega 6s. And so that's, I think, the, people, the thing that people need to wrap their hands around is, is, is when you get into the meat of this, the human body is always going to do the most efficient thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes sense. But with that, you know, there, it seems that there, there may be a, uh, a hint of validity to the concept that maybe uh, not that you're not going to store any of that protein as fat, but that some of it is going to get lost a little bit in, in, to a degree as far as that energy in. Uh, compared to fat, for instance, yeah, or calorie. I, I would I would agree with that. I, I think if where this would come into play for me, like like contextually, where too much protein would come into play is someone who's trying to maintain weight loss. 
-hmm. like that it could be an easier way from a satiety mechanism to overconsume protein because you're probably we don't this isn't this is an inexact number this is this is extrapolating from you know mechanistic research and, and rodents and you know the one trial that we do have the one metabolic ward trial of 56 days that we do have in humans and it looks like about 60 percent efficiency so you're going to use so if, if you say you overconsume uh protein by you know 60 grams maybe you're going to take 36 of those and you're going to be able to use it as fuel so there is kind of because remember you aren't you aren't it has a higher thermic effect of food so you are going to burn about 25 to 30 percent of it it's arguable whether that matters in terms of mixed meals i think this would come into play when you look at kind of uh jose antonio studies he's had a ton of free living studies that that a lot that's where a lot of this this thought process comes from is uh it looked like from those free living studies that you could go as high as 4.4 grams per kilo which yeah. is, is an insane amount of protein um, and for a long period of time, these are long longitudinal observational trials. The problem is that they are dietary recalls. And I mean, I've gotten thousands of dietary recalls in college students, and I can tell you that they're terrible. Yeah. Like they're not, this is not a precise nor is it an accurate measurement. Uh, and then you have kind of the bias of, of college students. These are probably students in his lab and, and know that I'm, I'm not speaking negatively about the study. This is just how things work. Um, and so they had a high dropout rate. You have this, this probably wanting to, all right, so I know I have to eat this amount of protein. I can just put it in my fitness pal. And, and they're not probably lying out of, you know, to do it maleficently. I don't even know. Is that a fucking word? <laughs> Are you going to ask? Them? I learn about <laughs> yeah, so there you go, they're not doing it maliciously. They're not, I don't think they're doing it with the intent of lying. I just think it's something that happens with the bystander effect. And so these in the Antonio studies, they went as high as 800 calories, of, like on paper, over what they would have needed to maintain mm -hmm. their body weight, and they Which didn't gain weight. A whole, <laughs> just finding that number in itself is almost impossible, right? Yeah, finding yeah. the so so if we think about this hierarchy of needs, if you are trying to gain muscle mass, like so that's probably the majority of the people that are listening to this. Maybe some just health nerds. So if you're trying to put on muscle. You want, that's the first ticket you gotta, you gotta figure out is how many calories can you consume and stay weight stable or gain a little bit. Yep. And then it, it, we're really arguing about the minutia because if you're in an excess, you probably only need, you don't need that much protein as much as people want to eat mm -hmm. protein. It's not going to hurt you. You just have, for me, if someone's running a bulking cycle and they like a lot of protein, I don't care. Yep. I just want them to stay consistent. Like if you're going to eat, you know, 1.5 grams per kilo or three grams per pound of, of protein, I don't care. Do that, but don't don't oscillate it. Yeah, Because yeah. then then we have no idea. Then, yeah, then so we have too many inputs. Serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's something I want, I want to talk about for sure. Is is uh, I think that our right, well, we we now understand that uh, excess protein is probably not going to lead to bigger muscles in itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what we know that we need is is a uh, a caloric surplus at some point. Like we're we're trying to be anabolic, right? Like so we need to have more calories coming in than going out from the simplest standpoint. And I think that that gets forgotten often as people get mixed up in that minutia of things or, uh, you know, am I, am I maximizing the amount of protein that I can eat? Am I eating enough carbohydrates to stimulate insulin or some bullshit like that, you know, which mm -hmm. we already kind of ruled out, uh, you know, uh, what, is, what is kind of the negative on, on that side of things? If we are eating too much protein, you already kind of mentioned it, but I, I don't want to skip over that point because I think it's so important the negative to me is you don't consume enough calories. Like, cause I, I think the biggest thing that you and I see in, in advanced trainees is wasting time. I yeah. think a lot of people just fucking waste time trying to be lean, um, trying, trying forever trying to be lean and not living in an excess, not being willing to get a little bit chubby in, in, in the name of putting on more muscle. And so it can be really, really hard to eat an excess of calories. Like just, and, and so Luis and I talked about this is, is if you, the more restrictions that you put on yourself, the harder it's going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm trying to gain and it's been three weeks and I haven't been able to gain a sink. I've lost weight. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the, I, I'm, I move a lot. You can tell even with my hands, but I mean, I have everything. I have chips, I have ice cream and I only, I only eat protein at two meals because otherwise if I eat it at three meals, if I have three whole meals, I will overconsume protein yes. regardless. Oh, yeah. Um, cause I want to eat 
for me personally, I like eating large portions of protein in a meal. Like I want to have seven, eight ounces of meat at a meal. If I eat five ounces or four ounces of meat, I kind of just in my head, I feel cheated. Um, but if I eat seven ounces of meat at a meal with a protein shake, I'm, poof, I'm, I'm way too high. In the, in the terms of inefficiency, because I'm already struggling to eat enough calories with chips, ice cream, all these hyper bowel, using these hyper bowel foods that you would never use in the general population in the weight loss sense. Um, so that to me, that to me is the biggest negative is that you're going to live in this land of nowhere where you're not getting shit done because you're not in excess. Uh, and you, you could have the greatest program in the world, but I, I think that once you get to this point of, you know, your FMI is um, way above the 24, uh, you're going to have to, everything starts to matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we can't even really measure muscle growth effectively. That's probably another podcast in this population. So you better make sure that you got all the wheels on the bus uh, and that you're doing everything that you can. And then maybe we don't really know what the genetic potential is, but maybe you can put on more muscle. And that's, that's the fun question to me. And so I just want to help people be as efficient as, as possible in that. And I think too much protein is a way to just waste time. Yeah. 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 And that makes total sense. And that's what I've seen uh, with myself, my clients, uh, plenty of bodybuilders, especially because we're just push this protein concept so hard. And I think you also actually run the risk of uh, you, you mentioned a lot of like those hyper palatable foods. And mm -hmm. I think when it comes to, and this is probably a different, uh, conversation, but carbohydrate consumption, it probably doesn't really matter what you're, what kind of carbohydrates you're eating. As long as you're eating, uh, some amount of fiber and you're eating, uh, some micronutrient, micronutrient dense foods, like and I, I'm thinking vegetables when I'm talking about this. And a lot of times what happens, at least with myself, especially I can say that, uh, when I was trying to cram in eight protein servings a day, I, I just cut out vegetables altogether. Mm. So the impact that that has on digestion, um, you know, maybe we're not getting the micronutrients from, from the soil anyway, but, uh, I think there's probably some things of vegetables and things that are, that are beneficial, probably more beneficial than the seventh serving of, of chicken that I had that day. Right. So I, I think that for, for the listener, like if you're having trouble gaining weight, if you're having trouble eating food, because anyone who's done this for a long period of time knows that at some point you're going to look at your plate and want to vomit. Uh, and when you get to that point, that's how you know you're probably at a good place. Uh, but you might want to start manipulating some things. And this could be one thing that you could change is, is potentially pulling back some of that protein. Um, you know, you just mentioned only eating protein twice a day. Um, I mean, that might set yeah. some signals off for people. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. Yeah. So how I do it is I have a protein shake with an RX bar in the morning. So I'm making sure that I hit my losing threshold at least four times. So I'm just having smaller protein boluses and then two bigger protein boluses. So I, the, we both kind of think of everything in bumpers and that there are no hard and fast rules. And, and so one of the bumpers, if you want to gain muscle, it looks to be that you want to have more frequent training stimulus to max. If you're advanced, because your muscle protein synthesis response is probably going to last 24, 36 hours. Less than when you're a beginner. Less than when you're, if you're a beginner, you can train once a week legitimately and you'll have a, you'll have a muscle protein synthesis response for like seven days. But once you get advanced, you can probably recover a lot faster. Hopefully, hopefully you're not changing your exercises all the time. Repeat about effect. You're going to, you're going to probably want to train every 24 to 46 hours in terms of every muscle group, just to get that muscle protein synthesis response. Cause that muscle protein synthesis response is probably capped. It's probably like, so you're just after chronically hitting that boom, yep. boom, 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 boom. And that's how I think of it is just hitting that hammer as much as possible. Um, and so where does protein intake fall on that? It's probably if you're, if you're getting four boluses at 0.4 grams per kilogram, we're good. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that you need to focus on, you know, how all the other things, if you've got that down, great. I don't, I don't, I don't think that it even matters. Like unless you're training fasted. Oh, that's the other thing that I would always have protein in the system mm -hmm. before training i think that's the most that's the most logical thing to me if we're after running mtor um if we're after growth you probably always want to be running have that substrate in the system um if you do train fasted if you enjoy that then i think protein timing comes into play mm -hmm. and for those of us who are not good at math uh not that i, don't, I know any of them point four grams per kilogram what, what does that look like on average for, for an average person how much protein you need before it's like 35 you're grams yeah. for me not hard yeah. uh, that's so, so it's pretty easy right so for most people uh it's worth it if you're waking especially the early morning people uh this i've always had to, to kind of persuade people to do this but uh, if you're an early 5 a.m lifting person it's worth it to have that scoop of protein before you go to the gym 
Uh, you're, you're, hopefully you're going to be able to digest that. If you can't, then you, you probably have other issues. Uh, call this guy about that. No, I think, uh, I but, think people like malabsorption is super rare. Like I, yeah. especially when you're talking about like isolated nutrients like that, like, that, like your body's going to be able, and if you can't have whey, um, the option would probably be there's egg white protein, yes. there's stuff like that. There's other proteins. You do have to go to a vegan protein or a collagen based protein. That's where your amino acid situation might come into play. So then you want, might want to add about, you know, 10, maybe 15 grams of essential amino acids to that. So that, that would be the only, if I think shakes are incredibly useful, right? But I think that people can get in trouble with shakes because they are such a dense protein source. And mm -hmm. like you're, if you're pounding shakes all day. Yeah. yeah. It's a, like, 20, I mean, what we're looking for is, is, uh, two to 2.5, maybe three grams of leucine. And, uh, yeah. that's it. Right. So that's a, and for uh, a high quality protein source, it's only going to be 20, 25 grams of protein. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're looking at some of those vegan sources, it's going to be a little bit higher, but higher. that's, but that's something you can look at, you know, like check that label, uh, you know, and, and I would, it, it's, it's worth doing, especially if you're at that higher level. Uh, if you're, if you're pushing that FFMI over 23, those little details become, important to a degree uh, and females for an fmi would probably around we don't have as much we don't have as much data on this but it's probably at 20 so if you're uh when we talk about fat free mass index that's like kind of the most that we think you can put on mm -hmm. uh with or drugs obviously script the situation but yeah right. just, and even aside from that you know just just someone who's been training for a while on a good training program that's been eating well that's been sleeping if you're at this plateaued stage like things start to matter a little bit uh, you know, but I think that we focus on some of the wrong things, some of that minutia that, that is not as important, but uh, certain things uh, can make a difference if you compile that over a year, a decade. Uh, and that's, that's really what we're looking for when we take drugs out of the equation. It's, that's the game. I mean, it's little changes, man. <laughs> like, so you better love the game if you're, if you're, if you're going to go that route. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think all that, that stuff is super helpful for someone who, uh, who's been just reading bodybuilding magazines for a while and, and even the uh, ones that are educated, you know, I think that it's still, it's still out there for sure. Um, anything else you want to go over with this? I mean, I, I, think I mean, I, I grew up lifting in the nineties and I think that we just got, we thought that if you ate more protein, you would put on more muscle. Yeah. It does. Like if you grow up, if you grew up reading like muscle and fitness, like, you, Oh man, it, it was kind of pounded into you like that. You needed a ton of protein. Um, and you, and you needed it right away. You had to, but that doesn't, if we think about how adaptable the body is, it's, it's not the case. It, it, yeah. Yeah. It, it makes sense. I to touch on, even on the anabolic window stuff. It's like, you don't build muscle the second after you finish your training session, you know? So it is going to be this process that takes place. Um, like you said, that, that MPS response is going to be elevated, even if you're advanced for 24 to 36 hours. So uh, it's, it's, yeah, th that's, those are the kind of things that probably don't matter that much, like scrambling to, to have your protein shake with, uh, dirty, you know, gym tetanus fingers, uh, like trying to eat your protein. Like th th that's probably not that important. There's another, there's another thing there is, is cause a lot of people will say, so, all right, so we have this 24 to 36 hour window, right? Where muscle protein synthesis is, is, is higher. So that's the window that we would probably want our excess of calories. So that, mm. to me, there's this, there's this, there's this idea that maybe needs to die of multitasking. Like people are trying yeah. to do way too oh. much shit at the same time. Like if you are trying to gain muscle, like this is, I always think of like, if you're trying to do a hard task, like if I'm trying to build a house, or I'm doing something complicated. I want to, I want to be focused on that task. If you are trying to gain muscle and you are advanced, be focused on the task, right? Like don't try to be doing like seven different things at once. Don't try to be like improving your power clean or improving your snatch or like, like it drives me crazy. Like if that is your one thing, you are trying to maximize training volume, maximize calories and nothing, maximize sleep um, and, and minimize stress. And, and, and that is, that is the game. And everything else is, is noise in my, in my opinion. Totally. Yeah. I think a lot of people like the idea of gaining more muscle mass until they hear that. And that's reality, man. Like, I mean, at some point, just because you got better at all those things in the beginning, doesn't mean that's going to happen forever. <laughs> and just because, uh, your friend is able to do it, uh, that has incredible genetics and, and, or, uh, some pharmaceutical help. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that you're going to be able and to it might it. not even be pharmaceutical help right now. It could have been like they took drugs when they were 18 and Huge now drug. they have, now they have more myogenic potential yeah. than, than, and so it's easier for them. So, yeah. 
it's like anything else. I mean, like you're, you're not going to try to learn five different instruments at one time. Uh, you know, like you really, if you want to get mediocre at all of them, sure. Uh, and, and like, that's, that's a big like battle that I think that we're both trying to, to, to fight right now is, is the, the big one is just like, how do I stay lean and get bigger? And I'm just like, man, we're like, we're going to run some, some studies to try to figure out if you really can. But my hunch is that at a certain place you can't, um, you know, I, and I, I'm pretty damn certain about that. I mean, unless again, you have some, some different assistance or, or you're just one of those freak shows, but even the freak shows at some point, like they just stop gaining, you know, you're going to so, run out of runway. That's right. Totally. Yeah. So and it only makes sense. I mean, you're literally sending two different signals. It's a, it's an anabolic and a catabolic signal at the same time. Like that, uh, it, it just, it doesn't work. The only time that works is with some type of novel stimulus. And that's why it works in the beginning. Cause you're going, if you start resistance training, uh, your body's not going to have much of a choice, but to repair that tissue regardless of what's coming in. And there's been research on yeah, that. You can turn that. fat into muscle when you're beginning. It, it, the, that's the problem with the fitness industry is anything can lead to body recomposition in a, in a new trainee. Like the research is like nonsense, like a Zumba. I don't care what it is. Like just getting you off your ass and moving when you haven't been moving, you will put on muscle. You will, you will recomp with fairly little, changes to your diet right like you can just do broad scale changes and so make sure that the tool matches the task and i think that you can we can get lost in that and if you are trying to gain you the tools are access of calories maximizing training volume right and, and probably having a training frequency of th at least three to four days per week like that's gonna that's gonna take over your life a little bit like I train six days a week. I know most of the time you're, you're, you're training at least six to seven. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is, this is the game. And if, if you want to play the game, play the game. If you don't want to play the game, uh, don't say that you're playing the game and just annoying people. Yeah. 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 Uh, especially if you're a coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing is, nothing is more annoying to me than people saying they want something and then doing the, not be, not being willing to put in the effort to get that something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, I would love to at some point talk about some of the psychological components of that. Cause I, I think that that's, I mean, that's something I've become like extremely passionate about and um, you know, especially with the social media aspect of things and mm -hmm. just people feeling like they have to look like they're ready at all times to be on muscle and fitness that, that, that gets in the way of, of this stuff. But you know, if that's what you want to do, totally cool, man. I like, I have no issue with that. Completely um, different game. It's, it's a total, just know that it's a different game. And the people that you see that are that appear to be doing uh, what you want to be game. doing, yeah, that, that really is. Yeah, get yourself to it to a play Could, because you're going to get eighty to ninety percent of your results in terms of hypertrophy and probably strength in the first year. Uh, you know, so if, if that's what you want to do, if you want to just look your absolute best uh, all the time, like there's going to be consequences, and, and that is going to definitely have an impact on your performance and your ability to progress. But if that's what you want to do, that's, that's fine. You know, <laughs> but I uh, just understand that it's different. What we see people doing with that is like when they want to leave, live lean, they, they get it. They, we get addicted to like making gains in the gym. And so they've, they've kind of, they've had these three to four years of training. So they've gotten stronger and now they're unwilling to go. If you're a guy, maybe they're unwilling to go over 10% body fat. And they want to have resting abs all the time. And so what we see is those guys then chase novelty. Cause they're after, they want to win. Like we're all, we're all dope. And if you're in this game, you're all dopaminergic. So what we see is they just hop around yep. like they're living lean and they're just program hopping so that they have this, they essentially have this allure of winning that it's, it's completely fan. It's completely ghosted, but it's not real. They're just, they're just chasing novelty and they, it looks like they're winning, but they're probably just, they're just staying. In the yeah. Winning is not adapting. <laughs> okay. Like that's, it's a completely different thing. So you can go, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I tried to push Ben's car down the mountain today. I wasn't able to do it. Um, mostly because Ben wasn't helping at all. I was doing hundred percent of the work. Uh, but you know, if I trained that ability, I would get better at doing it. Mm -hmm. Would I grow? Would my quads get any bigger? Fuck no. Like, uh, they're probably going to get smaller because I would have to take away from my training, uh, things that I'm doing for hypertrophy to be able to do that particular task. And you have to wear shoes. And I won't wear no, shoes. Yeah, yeah I can't wear shoes. Uh, my feet just get too sweaty. Yeah, then you yeah. just like sloppy. And then there's nothing. Every time you take a step, it's <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm definitely sweating right now as we speak. But this is probably the driest I've been in about a week. So, yeah. You heard that here, guys. You heard that here first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else that, that, that we feel is important? 
on this topic? I, I, I guess maybe we, we, I don't know if we touched on just the benefit of maybe, I guess we kind of talked about it indirectly, but just to reinstate, there's probably a benefit to eating a little bit more protein when you're dieting, mm. if you wanted to do that, uh, you know, for forever likes dieting. That is, that is a completely, we have to contextually, that is a completely different topic. Um, so now like in an excess, we're both, we're, I think most of us are in agreement that protein, excess protein is inefficient at, at best. Um, it's definitely not going to help you. Um, so we've, we've hit that and that, that's kind of the, I guess our target audience audience with this is people who are gaining. Now I, and this isn't, that's eventually you're going to have to cut. I mean, you can't just live in a gain phase the whole time. I think both of us would oscillate between maybe nine, and then we argue about the top end of body fat percentage. It's, it, you're going to get puffy, like 16%. Like yeah. You're going to get self-conscious. Sometimes your nipples will get bigger, too. So, so, different topic. Different, different topic. topic. That's the refeed <laughs> but, but, but a real thing? A real thing? A real thing. Real mm-hmm. thing. Look it up in the research. Or my shirt. Um, <laughs> that's a different podcast how can you have all the symptoms <laughs> of, seen, of a drug user drugs. but be lifetime natty and have no muscle yeah, and, yeah. And, and, but you, your girl did did call me out I thought I had bigger facts than you yesterday and yeah she, we she, tested. Shut, she shut you down and that was a certified measure that's, yeah yeah that's certified. how Sean felt handcuff all measure, right? yeah the handcuff yeah. handcuff yeah. CSA yeah. Handcuff CSA. Is, <laughs> That's, is the new and if you come out on it, we'll, we'll do it for you for yeah. free. Handcuff. We're having a hypertrophy. Uh, we won't be able to do that, obviously, with females because they're not after that pec growth as much as the guys. Nah, no, it's not uh, but it's definitely, definitely won't happen. But we, we will do cross sectional area of, of your biceps. Uh, the with body, a legitimate measure, actually. With the ultrasound. But yeah, also hands, the handcuff. Like, if you like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but then after each form. So, so when we're decreasing calories and we're trying to cut <laughs> is there a benefit to to protein and do we measure it via uh hand cuffing csa mm-hmm. so menno and uh and eric helms had a big to do about this about a year back maybe six months back um kind of arguing about does excess of protein uh is it helpful going up to this this idea of two points then you kind of they get into the land of lean tissue uh so 2.3 to 3.1 grams per kilogram of lean mass was um, was Helms did his dissertation on this, I believe, yeah. um, and so the this is actually it's a it's a nuanced topic, but it is actually pretty important because if you are driving a caloric deficit, you are driving a deficit in every macro potentially in every macronutrient. Mm-hmm. You, the least thing you don't want to drive a deficit in protein because then you'll lose muscle mass. So the game if you're an advanced trainee is to not lose muscle in a, in a cut. And so how do we do that? Well, we keep our resistance training volume high. Uh, we sleep because that, that can have a direct effect. And then we also eat enough protein. Those are kind of the, the, the biggest, the biggest things. And so what is enough protein? And that's kind of what the argument was. And it, it's because if you eat protein and you're in a deficit it has to come at the cost of something else. Yes. That, and, and those things become very, very important because the feasibility of the diet and then also maintaining hormonal balance and like, performance in the gym yeah and the stimulus i mean we need to we need to maintain the stimulus of uh that got us the muscle mass in the first place so if you drop out all of your carbohydrate for protein and that's all another debate i suppose but if you can't perform in the gym like that's going to fuck you do right correct yeah. and so that's that's the debate and i i'm on the side of that debate you can look that you can google that we can link that out uh it, it's it's uh it, it gets in the weeds and, and I appreciate the weeds. Uh, I'm on the side of lower, like 1.8 grams per kilogram, staying at that 1.8 grams per kilogram and then maximizing whatever you want to consume, carbohydrate or fat. Uh, um, and so, because both of those are going to increase the feasibility of the diet because you have more to work with. Um, pro- you could, you could go higher in protein, right? Because, and, but I would do that at the expense of carbohydrates. And know that you're going to oxidize it. Maybe you're going to be more efficient at that process. We don't know. Mm-hmm. You, my guess is you would be more efficient at oxidizing that um, in a cut. And, and, and so that would – and also in a cut, interestingly enough, because you're trying to maintain muscle mass, this idea of um, four to five boluses of 0.4 grams per kilogram of protein seems to become less important. So the intermittent fasting research, um, alternate, even the alternate day fasting research – looks like you can maintain muscle mass it's if you're because you're not going to gain muscle mass like in a cut like if you're advanced 
If you if you're not advanced, you can gain muscle in the cup. But if you're unless you're cutting from twenty percent to fifteen percent body fat, but if we're talking sub, we're talking single digits body fat. You're not nothing's happening. <laughs> you're you're best going to maintain muscle mass. The only we may catch an argument there in that if someone has a ton of genetic potential and they haven't maximized training volume, mm-hmm. they may yeah, yeah. Be like if they've had a shitty program, mm-hmm. they may sure, be able yeah. to gain. But if you've been following a really good program, you've been doing a you know, you're close to your genetic potential, you're not gonna be gaining muscle on the cup. Yeah. Um, your your one goal is to maintain as much as possible. And and that arguably is the most important aspect of bodybuilding. Yeah. It, that's what you see a lot with the, the veteran bodybuilders is uh, they don't actually get any heavier in the off season. They don't necessarily gain any muscle in the off season. They just get better at dieting. And by better at dieting, they mean maintaining lean body mass. So you know, especially the further down you get in body fat percentage, the harder it's going to be to maintain lean body mass. So at some point, you know, if you're, again, if you're cutting from 15 to 12%, uh, if that isn't all that difficult for you, you're, you know, you're probably going to be fine there. Uh, I, I mean, I, I know with myself going through enough uh, bodybuilding preps, like there's a, there's a sweet spot for me where uh, I start coming down and actually start feeling better, especially relative strength wise, like pull ups and things like that are, are you know, I'm, I'm crushing at some point around uh, 215, 210. Yeah, for you, that's probably like 11%. That's probably, yeah, maybe, maybe 10, mm-hmm. right? Once you get underneath that, it is to shit everything. And then you're just hanging on. And that would be arguably your power lift. Right. Yeah, that's what you would try. Yeah, if you're trying to maximize uh, your sports performance, anything really, mm-hmm. I mean, fighting, uh, like anything that has to do with moving your own body mass. Um, yeah, I mean, that's going to be, it's probably worth it to find that. But I think that that's at the later stages. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, we know that there you have uh, just better myogenic potential as you're when you're younger. Uh, so you want to build up that shit as much as you can. So my advice, if I could get uh, especially myself at 15, 16, I started competing in bodybuilding when I was 17 years old and I was doing all sorts of crazy dieting shit when I was between 10 mm-hmm. to that, to that age. If I could go back or if I could get someone uh, at, at my level that time, I would do just eat and, and lift, <laughs> like just eat and lift and eat and lift and then go fix that stuff. So even for a, a, a fighter, a, a, you know, any other body weight athlete, a, a power lifter, I would encourage them to gain as much muscle as much strength, uh, as much performance as possible in the beginning, and then work out those details once you get advanced. Find out where, uh, hey, maybe it's at nine percent for you. Uh, your relative strength is is through the roof. You're not suffering, and and you know when that is. Like I mean, like once your sleep starts, and you're to maximizing suffer, calories at yeah, that weight. Yeah, exactly. You get as many calories as you can. Keep eating until you uh, actually start gaining weight, because mm-hmm. <laughs> you'll find that that there's a there's a definite cap uh, at, at some point. Like, I mean, for some people, they have to overeat like. 2000 over what their, their, uh, interpretive, uh, maintenance would be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, find those numbers first and then start to play with where your, your sweet spot is. Uh, I think that's incredibly important if you want to get as far as you can maximize everything. Yeah. This, I uh, that's a, we don't have a lot of data on that. Like Ryan and I've talked about like that, those, those kind of those younger years where you are going through puberty, where you do have this, you know, you do have a lot of, big anabolic response like your, your skeleton systems changing like um and so if we think about drugs and and we know when you have more testosterone you're going, one of the big things that you get is you get a myonuclear response so you you get more myonuclei so you can potentially produce more muscle forever that stays um, that doesn't go anywhere doesn't even go. with training that's why lifetime natural natty is a thing is because if you've taken drugs you've you've essentially change the amount of muscle that you can, you can have on board um, genetically. And so the, the thought process that we have, and this is a complete hypothesis, is that those younger years when you're potentially driving testosterone pretty high um, and whenever you're hitting puberty, those younger years become really, really, really important for training. Um, and and you, see, you see the populations that have maximized those numbers, and it's offensive linemen. You know, it's, it's those kids that They're they just told to eat. <laughs> eat the house. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and those dudes, they, they die down. They are fucking jacked. Like if you look at that from my research, like those are the guys who are in the thirties mm-hmm. because they, they were just, they could, who has the highest, who has the highest amount of muscle mass sumo wrestlers. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so then you run in, the game that you're playing. Then if you are listening to this and you are young is you are going to have to die it down. Right. And so may, that means that if your brain is going to freak out. And so what we found is that 
if you got as high as 280, 290, right, and you were 34, 35% body fat, carrying that around with a shit ton of muscle, your brain is now found, now thinks that that is safe, right? And so if you, that is your, that is your level of safety, right? So this, this bulk, uh, you probably don't want to get too big if, yeah. you're think, if you're thinking about it. Like, mm-hmm. so, because then if, when you die down, you're going to have all those metabolic adaptations. Your brain's going to freak out. You're going to become super food oriented at not that low of body fat percentage. Yeah, it's more about the relative amount of fat loss that you've lost, not the absolute number. So it's not about being 10% mm-hmm. body fat. It's about coming from 20% body fat to 10%. And, and you look at the guys who can maintain 9%, 8%. And they never got higher. They never got, they were always lean. They mm-hmm. never got fat. Yep. Uh, and, and then there's there are those people that can maintain that at eight or nine, but talk to them. Like they're fucking crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. I, I, I mean, you can talk to me. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, maintaining eight or nine, like you, you put me at eight or 9% and I, like, Everything has to be on point. Like, yeah. I'm not, I'm like, it's not going to happen. And it's, and you're, it, it's not even that everything needs to be perfect. There's, there's a very big level of restriction there. Uh, like you're overriding everything that your brain, your body wants at that point. So that's, that's a question that you have to ask yourself is, is it worth it? And, uh, you know, again, if you're trying to maximize muscle mass over a career, I, I don't know. <laughs> to me, it's to me, it's kind of worth it because what I see is those people who are naturally lean, um, they that's great, like cool, awesome. You got you can kind of eat whatever you want and stay eight to nine percent. But I would guess that those people are never in an excess of calories. Yeah, they could get fat eventually. <laughs> yeah, eventually they do probably get fat because they don't have this cognitive awareness. But I also think in terms of muscle mass gain, I think that they never cap out their energy intake because mm. because just, for, just to be anabolic in because any they're way. not yeah. they're not having any cognitive level of oversight mm-hmm. and we know that if you want to be in excess of calories it is just at just as hard at a certain point as being in a deficit mm-hmm. and so there's they're not trying right they're they're they probably got into a good place they're they're at a high f of mind and they don't necessarily have to have it's never been hard and so they they're that that's a cool place i guess that's cool genetically but to me it's like this i care about the people i care about level of effort always mm-hmm. and so to me that's not a high level of effort they have cool you got there but you like i care about the person that got there got to that place and it took them 10 years and, and they they earned it yeah so so you don't believe that there's a non-responder i i mean no like you could have you could have shitty skeleton like if we think about both of us are like at the grocery store looking at people's ankles and wrists. Like, and you see some, you see some cankles and some, some heavy, some heavy hands. And you're like, Oh, that yeah. dude, that dude could be really big. Like mm-hmm. one of our, one of our good friends, Michael Lexman, like you look at his DEXA, the skeleton, it's scary. Right. It's just, yeah. it's just like pure bone. So this dude, if this dude's already at like a hundred. If you look at the calculation, he's already at 103% of his hypertrophy potential. And the dude's never trained as a, as a bodybuilder mm-hmm. ever. So yeah. he's got so much runway left. Yep. Um, and just the sheer amount of bone this, that this dude has is, is, is impressive. Yep. So yes, if you have, you know, if you do have slender wrists, you have slender ankles, you're probably going to not be able to put on as much muscle as much, as much muscle. Um, but don't make the argument that you can't put on any muscle. Like I, I'm, pr- I'm fairly confident that most guys with a lot of effort can probably get to a 24 F of mine or 20, mm-hmm. at least a 23.5. 20, you can, you can Google that. You can put in, you can, you can measure all this. Menno actually gave his calculator away for free. And so you can measure your ankles, you can measure all your measurements and you can see where you are. Um, both of us are, I'm like, my neck is like 102%. Like my, my quads or 93%. So unfortunately, I'm doing shit on a quad volume right now. Well, um, got that much, in the jungle, so. Yeah, much to my wife's dismay. She's not, <laughs> not what I'm already. At least already, you know it's already got zero yeah. thigh gap. They're getting big though. They're, they're, they're coming along. Thanks, they're thanks, under, thanks. Under yeah. you can't see they're currently touching. Yeah, they're touching. That's how I know they're touching. His thighs. No, <laughs> my thighs are touching his thighs for you. So what, my thoughts are still touching. If you're my still watching too. this video. Yeah. <laughs> this is bound to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it can only go downhill from here. Well, you know, just to bring the whole thing back around, um, you know, just to, can you just summarize it again? Like mm-hmm. excess protein, probably not that helpful, especially for that population we were just talking about, uh, the, the hard gainer, so to speak. Pounding more protein, getting uh, muscle gainer shakes, 
from GNC is probably not your answer. Um, maybe there's a benefit to, to having a little bit more protein when you're dieting down just to make sure but muscle. But there could be a maybe. cost there as well. And there's a cost, yeah. So that's, that's something uh, as a as a coach, you'd probably want to help someone figure out. I think know. feasibility is going to be the biggest thing. Yeah. Like, I where think, do they feel? When it comes out, I mean, it just real quick, like when it comes to dieting, I mean, it, it's, it's all psychological at some point. Like it's just like how far are you willing to push? And it's not about like, uh, at some point you're going to have to work hard, but you also need to find as many things as you can to be easy. So if that means like eating more protein is easier for you, that allows you to get through your day. You don't feel like you're going to eat someone's arm every time they walk by you, then that's, that's probably good. Uh, if you find that your performance is suffering from eating more protein because you had to pull that from carbohydrate intake or fat or whatever it was, um, it wouldn't be anything else. But uh, then, then it's probably not bad about alcohol, maybe, and that you probably shouldn't be listening to this if that's your idea of dieting. Uh, but you know that, that's uh, may, maybe beneficial, and uh, you know you're you're you can gain weight, like <laughs> you can gain muscle mass. Like oh, we'll probably have a training conversation at some point about really pushing training volumes and how to manipulate it from that side of the equation. But if you're having trouble gaining muscle mass, like you're probably not trying hard enough. Yeah. Right? I mean, if you're, yeah, I think if, if you're having trouble gaining muscle mass, you need to do a couple things. You got to eat more, got to train more, got to sleep more. And you probably need to look at what your life looks like. Mm -hmm. Like the, it, a man, again, does the tool match the task? Mm -hmm. So both of us have changed. We've, we've kind of reached this land of depreciating returns, right? Where, where we, you know, my, my back, I don't even really care about how much I back squat, but my back squat's on the same for like, you know, two or three years, pretty, my bench, my bench went up a little bit, right? Like, so, and, and I don't really necessarily care about getting stronger anymore. I just care about the process and like, can I have, can I check as many boxes as possible and, and give myself a shot um, at putting on my muscle? And so what is that? That's, that's managing my nutrition. It's managing my sleep for sure. Uh, manage my stress and not, not even in the sense of like stress reduction because that pisses me off. It's just your outlook on stress. Um, and, and so those, those, and then training, like I think that one of the things that we don't know is to me, the answer is probably if you got nutrition, sleep, and, and some kind of stress outlook, stress management, meditation, everything that goes with that. If you have those three in play big time, then to me, the game is training frequency, training volume. Yeah. Well, and assuming you have training quality as well, you actually know how to do, do it. You're picking the right movements. Exercises, you're doing that properly. Which, is an, which is an entirely uh, different. Yeah. It's, but yeah, it's uh, like, but which, the but point is, is, is you dude, don't. We're on a roll. Let's just have it. <laughs> let's go. It's a three hour podcast. Let's go. I mean, I got nothing to do today. My girlfriend's so gone. I, no one wants to hang out with me anymore. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you have the, the key though is that you have to have those other things in place first or it's not going to happen. I mean, you can, you can continue to push training volumes up and up and up. And if you well, what we see people, things, people do is try to push training volumes up with compound movements. Yeah. And that's, that is, so what are your limiters? Ryan and I are always thinking about limiters and in terms of hypertrophy, your limiters are going to be probably getting sick or getting injured and that is going to cut you down and then you're going to get acute load spikes and then bad shit's going to happen. So you want, most of our injuries are going to be overuse injuries. So if, you, if your game is hypertrophy, you need to kind of, you need to be able to put your ego away and you need to say, all right, for me, like, can I maintain my squat? Can I maintain my bench? Because I know that those aren't going to drive a ton of hypertrophy. Yeah. I've probably maxed those out. Like I'm 185 pounds and I benched 335. It's, it's pretty stupid, right? So that's not my best exercise for hypertrophy. Can I maintain performance on that from an ego standpoint? And then can I push volume and other stuff? Because those compound movements are going to have a cost. Um, they also, we, like the majority of us probably learned them when we weren't that good at moving. Yeah. So we have, a, we have maybe some maladaptive patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost, I'm getting to the point now where I think uh, probably even still a lot of people think that like the, the squat, for instance, is the king of all light exercises. And I'm getting to the point now where I almost feel like the, the more complex an exercise is, the worse it is for, for hypertrophy. Yeah. Uh, there's more things that the more there is involved, the, the more you're, it's, it's the same concept as, as trying to learn five different instruments at one time. Like if you're having to focus on your, your uh, maintaining axial skeleton where, where you need it to be, uh, you, you have to uh, deal with pressures and moving air. Uh, there's 
15 different joints involved in the, the and exercise. central fatigue yeah, too. Like central fatigue, just, yeah. Uh, the respiratory fatigue, like the perceived uh, exertion. Yeah, I mean, all of this, the more of those things you pile together, you're working five different systems at one time. So that very well may work in the beginning because all you need is a little bit of stimulus for each, uh, for each system. Uh, but if we're trying to be a, a very focused uh, organism on one thing, we're trying to adapt in one way, uh, the more focused it needs to be. So, I mean, you want to talk about functional exercises for, for bodybuilding, it's a, it's a freaking preacher girl, you know, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's a, like, there's, it's, she tries yeah, I mean, it's, if you can get better at those things, like the, that, that's probably uh, the best predictor of hypertrophy that we can really get in terms of day to day and week to week. Yeah, so, Pat. Pat had a, I always remember I was talking to him because we, we do, we did a lot of these, these competitions because the, I've trained with other people and I know that training environment is powerful, right? Like, like I've got addicted to CrossFit, loved it. Um, both of us enjoy the competitive aspect of this. Um, I Ryan, love it when people count my reps. Ryan yeah. loves when people yeah. count his reps. He all, he's a power lifter. Um, and so the, we love that competitive kind of aspect. And I was, I was talking to Pat and, and Pat doesn't give a shit about any of this. Well, I guess he does, but he was like, he just wants to be able to do cool stuff with weights. And, and so I was talking to him, I'm like, well, I want to, I want to have a, a competition that is going to be, you know, based on hypertrophy. And, and I was just like, and he was like, yeah, that already exists. It's called bodybuilding. And I was like, yeah, but I don't want to fucking do that. Like I have no desire. Like I, I literally have no desire to, cause I know I, I've seen firsthand many, many times. I've seen what happens when people go into those low body fat percentages. So, to me, I want to have a way to compete in kind of hypertrophy related things, but not have to have that sacrifice, not have to waste, you know, potentially nine months of a training year to diet. Yep. Um, and so, to me, the what one of the things that we came up with was, was the thirty sixty. It's kind of because it's got to be feasible, we right? We mostly stole it from Pat. Yeah, mostly. We mostly, mostly stole it from we Pat. We mostly stole it. It's, we, we, no, no it's ours. It's completely ours. Pat was not involved at all. No. Who's Pat? Uh, Pat Davidson. No. He's, he's in New York. He's, he's not. He's going to see it come at me. Not that right. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and so he doesn't like bodybuilding. And he doesn't, he, he doesn't even have that many shirtless dudes on his phone, uh, which is. <laughs> This is really, really embarrassing. I mean, your, your self-worth is, is kind of a, as a coach, is probably the amount of shirtless dude pics that you have on your phone. Right? Yeah. It's direct correlation to how strong you are, probably. Happy. Um, happy, <laughs> happiness. Happiness. And, and so I was trying to come up with this idea of like, hey, what are, what are the, what are the, what is some kind of task that we can all do that we can compete in that isn't going to completely fuck our training? And, and I came with the 3060 and, and as I've been training for that, I've realized like, yeah, this is still fucking stupid. Yeah, still this is still not that. helpful. Yeah. And like, if we want to have a real, like, like it or not, if we want to have a real hypertrophy competition, we got to do the handcuffing <laughs> test, <laughs> uh, but it's not sexy. Right. It's like, it's like, we got to do these ultrasound measurements or like you got to do a 10 rep max, a 15 rep max preacher curl. With a and who, who the fuck is watching that? And who's getting excited? Like, I'm going to slap his face. <laughs> You actually slap him in the face. <laughs> get, him, get him fucking hyped up about a 15 rep max picture, girl. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll end this one now. See, yeah. this is why we should have done it in separate rooms because you get too yeah. excited. <laughs> That's all you. But we didn't want to waste the internet. Yeah. God damn it. Well, yeah. I mean, it it is. It's gonna end the podcast now because this is my this is my specialty. Is I'm able to wrap things up in a bow and just throw some kind of stupid quote on top of it. So this is very appropriate. You have to appreciate the process. Yeah. But really you do. Cause if you're doing this shit for anybody else, like if you're doing it for competition, like you're always going to be sad. Uh, that that's the way it's going to go. Like you're going to lose. Someone's always better than you. Uh, like there, you have to, as, as much as this is you're going like, to get worse. Yeah. You're going to get worse. Like, I mean this, it, you will. And I've you know, done that plenty of times over the last couple of years and you keep sucking me into these competitions that you keep canceling. Um, you know, but you know, you have to <laughs> change the plan. Change no, plans. I'm not fucking do it. I'm all in. You know, no, I'm all in. I mean, I'm no, I'll structure my whole macro cycle for this thing. And then you can just tell me three weeks out. Dude, doing. you're going to win. I will, and then I'll be happy. And I'll yeah, have to share this with the guys. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you have to really just enjoy the, like Not going true. after that, uh, uh, you have to enjoy going after that, 
uh, that goal and just that process and know that like you're probably never going to be satisfied with it and that's why we do it you know and, and uh it can't be something that you're uh, you can show off to your friends all the time and uh maybe you can i don't know but it's it's uh i think it's if you're in it for different. that like you, you should probably should be in it send me pictures yeah <laughs> no, no. you don't have my number send him pictures if, you, you don't have my number you can't find me uh, poor Vita, thanks if you're still here thanks for listening uh, we will be, Ryan and I will be holding a hypertrophy camp in December of this year uh, where we will, you know, we're going to train. We're going to train hard. Um, there's not going to be any competitions. I guess it'll be a competition kind of every day. But we're going to do, you know, f- five days in a row of two a days. Um, and then we're going we're gonna to try to measure your repeatability. So that's, I think, one of the big things. If you're trying to maximize training volume, we want to know how many times you can train. Like, when can you recover? Um, and so that's what we're going to try to do. We're also going to get, you know, you're going to get cross-sectional area measurements. Um, we might even do an oral glucose tolerance test after you train. Uh, we'll definitely do a finger stick test for sure. Um, and so we're going to get you a bunch of data. And then our goal is to be able, if you, if you want to, if you want to work with, with, with Ryan or myself, great. If not, if you want, that doesn't matter. Uh, we would just want you to have the data so that you can kind of build yourself or work with someone else doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. We just want people to get better. Um, and we just want to give them the data and to, to allow them to maximize their potential. And also the environment too. I think the environment you've been here for multiple times, like just seeing when you control all the things and when you put yourself in the ideal environment, yeah, how many times can you train? Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's super pertinent to someone who's been training for a while. So if you, that's, that's the question really. Training volume, how can you maximize it? Mm-hmm. How can you periodize it? How can you get bigger? Oh, what's, the, what's the quote for the. Uh, more bigger equals more better. I put it in. Let's be honest. Please. Ryan's good. He'll say that later. Let's get working on it. Uh, the, the, 